Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce our Grand Rounds speaker, Dr. Sophie Arbifaville. Sophie has been working with me in the Infectious Diseases Diagnostic Lab now uh, for over nine, this is her ninth year with us. It's a great pleasure to have Sophie here. Just a tiny bit about her educational background. She went to med school at St. George's Medical School in Grenada and followed by a year of family medicine residency. She saw the light and she <laughs> then did a APCP residency at Stony Brook, at SUNY Stony Brook in New York, followed by microbiology and molecular pathology fellowships at the University of Iowa. So take it away, Sophie. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ferrari, for this nice introduction. And for me, it's a little bit weird today because usually I'm in the back, but this time I'm in the front and I can see all your faces. <laughs> but uh, today I will be talking about sequencing in the Clinical Infectious Disease Diagnostic Laboratory yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So um, I have nothing to disclose. And uh, my objectives today are to review singer sequencing technology to discuss the different application of Sanger sequencing in the Infectious Disease Diagnostic Laboratory, review next generation sequencing technologies and uh, some of the workflow, and uh, discuss our metagenomic next generation sequencing CSF project and the challenge that uh, is associated with the development of a clinical metagenomic assay. So when you enter the molecular diagnostic era, it's a point of no return. return. You can only go forward. That's it. <laughs> so we'll uh, review first generation sequencing. And the first thing that comes to my mind is Sanger sequencing. So just a little review how it's uh, the methodology of Singer sequencing. It's a chain termination method. And the way it works in a normal uh, DNA synthesis, you have uh, deoxynucleotide. And I'm sorry because the little uh, arrow on my computer, you won't be able to see it here. But let's see if it works. Sorry about that. No, I'm going the wrong way. Okay, so it's and this you won't be able to see. It. So the normal nucleotide that is going to be incorporated in the DNA strand as it is synthesized is going to be the deoxynucleotide triphosphate. And it has to be have a three hydroxyl, uh, hydroxyl group at the three prime end to be able to be incorporated and that the DNA polymerase will form a phosphodiesterase bond. And so it's the way the polymerase, DNA polymerase will incorporate each nucleotide. In the single sequencing, instead of the hydroxyl group, we have an hydrogen molecule. And so we, it's a called deoxynucleotide triphosphate. And because we don't have the hydroxyl group here, then an over nucleotide cannot be added to the growing chain. And so it's the way uh, the singer sequencing is working. And so it's why we call it termination, because when this nucleotide is added to the growing DNA uh, chain, then it stops. It cannot go further. It's not uh, on my computer. I can see it, but you cannot see it on the. It, it's the problem, and uh, it's it's barely we barely see it here. So the um, way it's used in the lab, we go we do four different. Um, we're going to use four different uh, reactions. And in all those reactions, we're going to put the primer 
of the DNA we want to uh, strand, we want to sequence, a DNA polymerase, and we're going to add a free deoxynucleotide. And that is the regular de uh, deoxynucleotide, uh, deoxynucleotide. And we're going to put the four that are used for DNA synthetize, the adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. And we're going to add one nucleotide, part, uh, de de deoxynucleotide in each tube. So for this particular tube, we're going to add the de deoxynucleotide, the thymine, adenine, guanine, and cytosine. And the concentration needs to be at least 100 fold lower. So like that, in this particular tube, we're going to have replication of the DNA, and we're going to have uh, incorporation of the de deoxynucleotide randomly. So you're going to have a fragment of different size. And each fragment, the last nucleotide, will be a timing on this one, and the all different uh, fragments with adenine on this side. And then, when we finish the sequencing reaction, then at the time when we were doing it manually, we were, uh, it was uh, pour, uh, put in a gel, and depending on the line where you know that on this line you put your thymine, adenine, gu uh, guanine, and cytosine, and then we know that the fragments that are shorter will be have a lighter uh, molecular weight, and so we migrate to the um, electrophoresis, uh, gel electrophoresis faster, and so we go down. And so here it's then you can decide of um, which uh, nucleotide will be f uh, form the DNA sequence. So here you can see the uh, heaviest one is a timing, so we know it's a T first. Then the second one also is a timing, so it's a T, and so on and so forth, and like that you get your sequence. So it's easy when you have like 20 a fragment of 20 nucleotide, but when you get uh, like six or 700 uh, nucleotide that you want to sequence uh, and the gel are not always perfect, uh, then as you can imagine, it's not easy to uh, really read those gel. And uh, it's how they start uh, the human uh, genome project. So people were really getting expert at reading those gel. But a uh, light came. Uh, and then somebody decided, okay, why don't you put, we put a dye at the end of those de deoxynucleotide. And so, like that, we will use only one reaction, and then one uh, reader will be able to read the last uh, nucleotide on all those different fragments and give us which nucleotide, because it has a specific color for each nucleotide. So like that, we, uh, we it gets read in the reader, and then we get what we call a chromatogram, and each peak is a particular uh, base. And in the molecular lab, we add the Turley 1, Turley series for a long time, and those are very good, but the recently they move to the Turley 500 series which I have not tried yet. <laughs> and um, the thing with this uh, way of sequencing as uh, you can only sequence, to have a good sequence read, it's like 600 base pair, but uh, the, it's very accurate. The accuracy of this method of sequencing is very accurate for the base calling. And so how can we use this technology in the clinical uh, microbiology? And for that, I need to uh, reintroduce you to the ribosome, and particularly to the ribosome RNA. So the ribosomes are micromolecular complex composed of ribosome RNA and uh, proteins. And when uh, they get together, then they're going to form the large subunit and the small subunit. And they are very uh, indispensable to life because they serve as the site of biological protein synthesis. And so they link amino acids together in the order specified by the messenger RNA molecule that is right here. So they are found in all living cells because they are indispensable for life. 
So what we are interested in, it's not really the ribosomal RNA by itself, but the gene that code for the ribosomal RNA. And in the prokaryote, the ribosomes are made of a 50S subunit uh, for the large subunit and a small subunit that uh, contain the 16S RNA. And uh, so we are interested in the 16S RNA gene because this particular gene is a 1500 base pair uh, long and it has particularly um, constant region that is uh, present in all different bacteria. It's going to be the same for all bacteria. And then there are variable region. And in this 1500 base pair, we have nine, <coughs> nine variable region. The good thing about those constant region is that you can use them uh, universal primer. And with those universal primer, when you use them, you will be able to amplify any region of this 1500 base pair uh, gene in, for any bacteria. So you're going to be able to amplify universally the bacteria. Uh, when uh, more studies have been done in this 1500 base pair gene. It was, it's, a long, it's kind of a long gene, and so we know that the Singer sequencing has good read around like 500, 600. So if you want to amplify the entire uh, gene, you might need to do two or three reactions to a good sequence. But studies have shown that the first 500 base pair is uh, containing those three variable regions is give us enough information to be able to identify bacteria to the genus and species level. So it's what we are using it in the lab. And what are we using it? It's really the gold standard for bacterial identification right now. Uh, any uh, ambiguous uh, bacterial identification, the 16S will be the one we will all refer to. It can also be used in the lab for b bacteria that are difficult to grow, and so they don't grow enough for us to identify them by, by our regular mean of identification. Or some bacteria that are growing, uh, are growing, but because the patient was uh, taking some uh, antibiotic prophylaxis, then it changed the biochemical profile of those organisms, and so they don't give us good identification. And when it's a very important isolate, then we we'll use 16S sequencing to... Um, and so in our uh, uh, laboratory, uh, we were... Um, Lucky because Dr. Ferrari write a grant, a departmental grant, and we receive some fund to develop this particular method in the lab. And so the way the workflow, it's work here. So we um, start with a culture. We have some, uh, we pick up a colony for a plate. We do a DNA uh, extraction and we do some dilution because if there is too much uh, DNA, then you overwhelm your PCR reaction. So then we do, uh, we use our uh, universal primer to, identi uh, to amplify this fi first 500 base pair of the 16S RNA gene. And then to make sure we, are we have a good amplification and that we have the correct fragment, then we uh, do a, a gel. And here it's one of the resident and I, so I and the resident or the resident and I, it's. And so you can see here it's one, two, three, four, five, five, six, so we know we have the correct uh, target that we want to amplify. So when we get that, then we can process then to perform the cycle sequencing. And then we pull it in our uh, sequencer and then we get our chromatogram from here. So uh, that is good when you have still something kind of growing on the plate. But sometimes the organism don't grow at all and so we have a problem. But we are able now to identify bacteria species directly from the specimen. So it's very valuable when we have some organisms that don't grow directly on the, our regular media or some when we deal with joint fluid or CSF or tissue that may have died during transport 
or because of uh, antibiotic treatment, the organism is not growing. So we do a direct ext extraction uh, on the tissue itself. So the way it works, we have the, our uh, fluid or tissue and we do a nucleic extraction of the entire uh, piece of tissue or fluid we have. And then we do a dilution because we don't know at this time how much there is bacteria in our sample and we don't want to over... Um, when our uh, reaction, so we do uh, no dilution, one to two, one to four, one to eight, and we, have, we, st we are sta starting to do a validation in the, in the molecular pathology lab. And so here we have two examples where it was uh, both were right hip fluid. And so where we did our extraction, our dilution, and then we did our amplification. And as you can see, the, the straight uh, PCR didn't work because we were overwhelming the reaction. But the 1 to 2, 1 to 4, 1 to 8, we had good uh, amplification. And then after all our uh, um, analysis, it came up that this particular uh, fluid at Streptococcus agalactiae, and this one at Streptococcus disgalactiae sub equisemilis. So then we perform the same thing that the direct, sequ uh, the direct uh, colony sequencing, where we do our cycle sequencing, and then we do our, uh, we put it in the uh, um, analyzer, and it gives us a chromatogram. So here, like I mentioned uh, previously, we are doing a, a validation of drone fluid in the molecular laboratory. And here are some examples of the fluid. We have been tested what we grew in the lab. We are starting with to make sure then we have a correlation between what we grow and what we pick up by direct sequencing. And you can see we have pretty good uh, correlation. So for the yeast and the fungi, so we are dealing with a different ribosome because it's the eukaryote ribosome, and they are also formed by a large and small subunit, but they have a different uh, ribosomal RNA. And this time we're not going to be uh, uh, using the ribosome of the, uh, of the small subunit, but we're going to use the 28S and the internal transcri transcriber spacer. And uh, because uh, these are giving us more uh, um, data, there is more via variability between species, and so it gives us a better identification. So the ITS1 and ITS2 is one, uh, uh, that was the first uh, uh, gene that were uh, used to identify yeast and fungi. And then on the 28S, the D1 and T D2 region is another segment of the genome that uh, give us enough also variability and has some constant region that are able us to do those universal primer to identify, uh, amplify in any fungi and yeast. And they have a different length. So the ITS, IT, ITS1 and ITS2, usually we've amplified the entire gene here, including the 5.8 S ribosomal uh, DNA, and it's around six, 600 base pair. The D1, D2 is also 600 base pair, but uh, we can uh, amplify only the D2 region, and it's around 300 base pair. So here it's an example, and we were uh, amplifying, uh, testing different uh, yeast to um, find their uh, definitive uh, ident identification. And here you can see it's the D2, and it's one, two, three, around 300 base pair. So we have the right fragment, and here it's the <coughs> full ITS one and two, and it's uh, so one, two, three, four, five, six. It's the right length fragment. So we know we are amplifying the right. Uh, segment of DNA. So when we have, uh, we have our chromatogram, we have the uh, sequence of our DNA, how are we going to use it to find the definitive uh, uh, identification? So what we do, we use a BLAST, it's a basic local alignment search, search tool, and um, it's an algorithm from compa for comparing 
primary biological sequence information, such like nucleotide of DNA or RNA sequence. And the way it's, uh, the BLAST work, it search, uh, the a BLAST search enable a researcher to compare a subject nucleotide sequence that is called a query, with a library or database of, a se of sequence, and identify library sequence that resembles the query sequence above a certain threshold. And it's the library we use, it's, uh, it needs to be uh, a very complete library if you want to really find what you're looking for. And so the one of the most uh, complete uh, um, database that is uh, uh, public data database is the International Nucleotide Sequence Database. And this uh, database, you uh, can access it through the NCBI um, website. And the good, good thing about this database is that uh, it's a composite, it's a tech data from three big databases, the gene bank, which is the USC database, the European Molecular Biological Laboratory database, and the J <coughs> Japanese database. So it's a very uh, complete database. And then what we do, we go and we uh, use our uh, nucleotide uh, BLAST, um, and we put our uh, sequence right here. And then you can make some selection on do you want unculture, do you want to eliminate unculture uh, isolate in your um, search, do you want to use only sequence type material, which for uh, our, uh, re, uh, when we do our search, we use only sequence type material first when we do our search. And then you can use also uh, different database, more or less curated, because the problem with this particular database, it's open to anyone, and so anyone can put their data. And the problem is not everyone is accurate. And so, and the problem is everyone thinks they are right. So they, you know, you go, they grow an uh, organism and they said, oh, I'm sure it's that. They do the sequence and call it this particular uh, name, and it might not be right. And so <coughs> the good thing is now the NCBI has been giving some uh, RefSeq uh, database that help with that because they really double check the data and the data that are entered in this database. So then, when you do your uh, search, it, all, it came with uh, the top name is the one who has the identity score with the higher score. Higher score. And so here, uh, the identity with the higher score was strep pyogenes, and it was a strain <coughs> type. So we know if it's a strain type, it has been, it's the correct uh, name, and it had an um, identity score of 99.63, which is a very good score. So then you can look at the actual sequence and see where the two, your uh, query, your isolate, compared to the subject, it matched the best. And you can see here, we have two bases that didn't match. match. So we were missing the G here, and here we were missing the A, the adenine. So when it's like that, you can go back to your raw data, the chromatogram, and look, did we miss, did, is it really missing, or is it because it was a faint uh, peak, and we did, it was not called by the software. So you can go back and double check that. So we have also some guidelines that has been uh, published by the CLSI in the MM18 document. And this document gives us uh, a guideline on when are, do we have enough uh, enough uh, match, good match, to be able to call it to the genus and species level. And so to be able to call uh, uh, to the genus and the species level, you need to have more than, uh, in more or equal to 99.0% uh, correlation. 
If it's less, then you can call it only to the genus species, and even less than that, then uh, you might not able even to give it a genus uh, name. But like everything else, there is always some drawback. And the problem with this particular method of sequencing is that uh, if the, your uh, sample or even your colony you pick up on the plate, if it's mixed, then you're going to have a mixed chromatogram here where you're going to have overlap of peak and you won't be able to read then your, uh, your sequence. Uh, the problem also with this particular method, you're looking only at a small fragment of the genome, only the 16S RNA gene or then the 28S. Uh, so you don't have a full picture of what's going on. And then, so with this particular, then you cannot use that to test for susceptibility and so it cannot replace really culture. And then, like I mentioned, the private and private uh, publics and private nucleotide database. So like I mentioned, the usefulness of 16S RNA gene sequence as a tool in the microbial identification is really depending upon two key elements. It's that the deposition of complete, unambiguous nucleotide sequence and to publics or private database because if they give us the wrong uh, information, then we're going to have the wrong uh, result. And then the application of correct label, if you call it the wrong uh, bacterial name, then you have uh, the wrong answer. So now there is some uh, proper proprietary database that provide good oversight and potentially higher quality sequence data, but they are often limited by the number of reference sequence and species covered. And especially uh, it's if curation is performed manually or rely on less frequent updates. So some of those private databases are uh, updated only every year. And during this year, you might have novel species that has been discovered, then they won't be in this private database and you will be missing them out because they won't be in, in the database you're looking into. So here in uh, our, uh, the CLSI, uh, also give some uh, uh, guidance on which public database you should be using, the most accurate uh, database. And we, for the uh, bacterial NCBI, it's the one we use. And also we use the RDP from the Michigan State University. That's the two public database you, we use for bacteria. And for the fungi, we use again the NCBI because it's the most complete one. And then we use also the microbank one. They are pretty good uh, database. And so with uh, this particular uh, grant that Dr. Ferry was uh, able to get, we uh, did this particular study where we, uh, when we sequence to identify fungi, there we can use the ITS or the D2 region and then we wanted to see which one would be give us the best identification to the genus and species level, and also using two different databases, which one would be the best. And what we, our conclusion is that the D2 region was as good as the full ITS region at the genus level for the species it, it was not as good. And then the, the, the uh, microbank give us a better uh, genius and species level because it had a better curation. So sometimes it helps us to achieve this above 99% identity score. So now in the, we were able to develop it in the molecular pathology lab, and now it's a test we are offering and we can get uh, direct uh, identification from the colony right now, not the specimen yet. We are still working on that. So now, now that we, have, uh, we are uh, done with that and we saw the limitation of this particular Sanger sequencing uh, technology method, now, we are, okay, why not try next generation sequencing? Let's see what we can get from it. And so the, it's called also second generation of sequencing or next uh, 
uh, next generation sequencing or massively parallel sequencing. And there is four main technology, and they all rely on PCR-based amplification to allow, allow sig uh, signal detection. So the workflow, had, uh, there are some similarity in workflow, all those different uh, tech methods, and they all uh, start with uh, uh, DNA extraction. Then we do the uh, fragmentation of the DNA because we use small fragments. When you have the, uh, frag the right fragment, then you, do the, uh, you add some adapter at the end of those fragments, which is called uh, you are forming a library. And then from there, you have two ways of uh, amplifying. You can do the clonal amplification by emulsion PCR, or then you could do the clonal amplification by bridge PCR. If you go the um, emulsion PCR, then you're going to do the paro sequencing or sequencing by ligation to do your sequencing. If you go this route, then you're going to use the sequencing by synthesis. And we're going to focus on the um, sequencing by synthesis because Illumina is the tech. Oops, it's the technology. <coughs> it's it's used in Lumina, and Lumina is cover 90% of really the sequencing market. <coughs> so here it's all the different uh, instruments they are uh, offering. Some of uh, there is even more, but some of, some of them. <coughs> and as you can see, each one have a different uh, runtime, maximum read pa, uh, maximum reads per run and maximum output. So my seek 25 million and uh, 15, and then you have the Nova seek that is 20 billion and 6,000. So it's a big difference. And here I put Singer and to compare, but not really to compare because we are comparing kind of orange to our apples. But just to give you an idea, the maximum read per run is very low compare, and the maximum output is also low. But the good thing is the reads are long, 500 to 600 <coughs> base pair. Here, the reads are 300, 150, 250, 250. And this is going to become important, especially in the clinical microbiology, when we are looking to identify bacteria where no, we're not going to be able to <coughs> align those sequence against a reference. We're going to do, I need to do a de novo alignment. <coughs> so, just here to give you an idea what we are dealing with. Uh, so the virus, usually the um, genome is 170,000 base pair, and our uh, bacteria is 4.6 million base pair. So even if it's a small genome, it's still, still large enough. So the way the Illumina sequencing work, we do our um, DNA extraction, and then we uh, prepare our, uh, we first we fragment our DNA, then we do our library preparation by adding those adapters, then we pull it in the flow cell we, where those uh, adapters are going to get attached to uh, this flow cell, and we're going to do then sequencing. And we're going to have clusters of those uh, uh, sequencing. And all those clusters will have the same fragment of DNA that will be then sequenced. And then the sequencing, the way it works, is every time a base is added, it emits uh, a light, and then a picture is taken after each, sequence, uh, each nucleotide is added to the fragment, the DNA fragment. <coughs> So, and each base emit a particular light. So we have four different colors, each one for the four base. So when this technology came, we, at the beginning, it was only found in research lab, who had a lot of money. But as time 
passed by, the cost of sequencing uh, really decreased. Not that it's cheap, but because it decreased, it's something that we could consider cheap enough to bring into the clinical lab. And so we, in the clinical lab, the, we decided for the best way to use it to identify organism will be to use the metagenomics uh, shotgun sequencing because it's a method that's going to sequence all nucleic, nucleic acid present in the specimen. And by doing that, we have the potential to identify a variety of infectious agents. It could be bacteria, virus, uh, fungi, and parasites directly from the specimen. And so with a little grant that I uh, wrote with Dr. Ferrari and uh, Dr. Karagajan, we uh, uh, put this proposal to uh, together to implement uh, a next generation sequenci sequencing for the detection of microbiological pathogen in cerebral spinal fluid specimen. And we think it's going to give us the answer to the meningitis and encephalitis of unknown etiology. Uh, it's uh, why we can do it in the lab also, it's because now the speed uh, of sequencing has uh, increased. The turnaround time is much shorter than what it used to, because if it takes you four weeks to have an answer, then really in the clinical lab it's not applicable. But now it's uh, much faster and uh, it can take a few days or a week to have an answer. And then the technology had been already applied and some of the uh, paper had been published. So we were like, okay, we can try. But we knew, because not much literature had been published, we will be encountering a lot of challenges and many times we'll have to go back to the drawing board and ask questions. So first uh, question was sample preparation, nucleic acid extraction method, which one to use? We want to uh, maximum, maximizing the tricky uh, aspect of uh, extraction. We want to have a good yield. We want to have a good integrity and purity of our DNA. Then we need to have DNA extraction because those uh, organisms have uh, DNA, but we need to do also RNA extraction because there is RNA virus. And then because we know that bacteria have or some fungi have a, a strong cell wall, hard to break, uh, should we use bead beating? Here we did a little uh, experiment where we did gram positive, we took a gram positive and we did done an extraction with bead beating, without bead beating. And as you can see, the total read was the same, but really the bacterial read was much better when you use the bead beating because it really break down the cell wall and release the DNA. But when we use bead beating, aren't we going to damage some of the RNA virus? That's the drawback. Then should we use a manual versus automated extraction? And we know extraction is a big step for the metagenomic uh, sequencing and uh, already papers have been published showing that uh, extraction can have, have a bias on your final result. And here, so some uh, standards have been uh, put on the market to really uh, check your uh, mean, uh, your method of extraction. And here, the Zamo Biom uh, Biomics uh, has uh, offered microbi microbial community standards, where here it's what it's supposed to be in the these particular uh, standards and uh, they choose like three gram positive bacteria that are harder to uh, uh, break down the cell wall. They have some uh, gram negative road that are easier and they also, um, and this one they didn't have the yeast, but uh, just to show how you can bias your number. So your gram uh, negative are easy 
to uh, extract and when you do the metagenomic then you think you have a lot of your salmonella and escherichia coli and very little of staphylococcus or listeria that are gram positive but the reality this is a bias because that's the quantity you should have in your specimen so it can have a big impact on your final result and here we did a little experiment again when we used the community standards and we did a nucleosense easy mag extraction using bead beating and here we did the kaijan extraction manual not bead beating and here just one i pick it's the listeria monocytogenis here you have five percent of read and here when you don't use bead beating you can see you have only 0.7 percent of the read. So really, you have uh, a bias on your final uh, identification of organism and the composition of organism in your sample. So then the next question is which library preparation kit to use? Do uh, Nextera, Nextera XTDNA for, it's what we use for our DNA, it has been working pretty good, but then for the RNA, we had some problem because the RNA is much label, labile, and so it's uh, degrade really rapidly, and usually you don't have that as much as the DNA, and so we have been using the new gene, the trio, and the solo, and uh, we had some it's trial and error, and we might try over to see what we're going to get better result. Then the next question is uh, the NGS platform. Do we want to use ISIC, MySIC, NEXIC? So ISIC is uh, uh, good, but, uh, and it gives you 20 million of read per sample, but then it's going to increase the cost of your uh, metagenomic uh, sequencing. The MySIC is pretty good and it has a long base pair uh, read so it's going to be easier to uh, uh, to put the quantity to together and have a long read but it gives you only two million read per sample so you might have decreasing your sen sensitivity and then we might try the next seek it's a short read but it's going to give us a five million read per sample but then the next uh, thing to think about is the bioinformatics challenges. So first you need to, um, the adapter needs to be removed. The human DNA should be removed from the data. Then you must assemble all the content to have a long read. And then you need to use uh, a good database to cross-reference all your uh, data. So the choice of database and the parameter defining a match with the genus or species level must be chosen according to the desired speed and accuracy of results. So you want a fast answer, it's going to go fast, but the accuracy of the analysis is not going to be as good. If you want a better accuracy, it might take longer. So you have to get the right adjustment. So here, just a, a very uh, busy slide, but ready to show you the different pipeline that you can use, the SERP. We tried to uh, use this one because it was the one used by UCSF, and, uh, but uh, we had problem with downloading the program. Then you have Kraken, who is going to give you a quick taxonomy, and then you use Bracken to give you the, um, the abundance of the reads. Then you have Kaiju, this time to have better maybe taxonomy. They are using the amino acid sequence to uh, give a name. Then you have the centrifuge from John Hopkins or taxonomer is another one. And, but the Bracken, the Kraken, Bracken, uh, centrifuge and Kaiju are the ones that are the most widely used. So here, what we did with Todd working on it. Um, so we rewrite our own pipeline. And what we use first, we are using the Kraken for high precision. Then we use Bracken to give us the how many read we had, the, the abundance of read in the 
the data, and then we get it's a fast, we get an uh, initial report pretty fast. And then we will be rerunning it uh, with a more stringent uh, um, filter to make it to even increase the sensitivity and uh, accu the accuracy of the abundance. <coughs> and then eventually what we really want to do is to be able to do de novo assembly of the entire genome and then able then to use uh, like more than 600 base pair and do a blast. So like that, we have a better accuracy of our uh, identification. So first, when we did the study, the FAST, it was using only 31 base pair to do the alignment, which is very small fragment to, be, uh, to have a definitive ID and sure of your identification. So Todd changed this parameter to five times 31, so almost more than 120 base pair, something like, which was more accurate. And then oh, we also use a negative control uh, to uh, compare, to make sure we are not introducing any contaminant in our specimen. <coughs> then the database, you, uh, we use the uh, public database. The RefSeq genome is the best and the more uh, complete database, but we know the drawback also, same problem with uh, inaccurate entry, and, uh, but we, for right now, RefSeq is pretty good. And here, just to show you what really we are dealing with, is when we take a human sample, really the problem is most of our read are going to be human, and only a small portion will be the pathogen we are looking for. And so we need to have a good confidence when we look at those data that we are confident that's a true infection and not possible an introduction of a contaminant or some over. So it's why we always use our negative control. We have a negative control and we go into that anything that is amplifying the negative control with our um, data. So um, really, what I like this uh, diagram because it really tells us what we are dealing with. The more uh, human uh, read, the more internal control, the less pathogen read we're going to get. And we need to have confidence that uh, those small number of pathogen read are true infection. So there is right now some ca commercial essay that offer metagenomic uh, uh, sequencing uh, for clinical uh, specimen. We have the carious test and this particular uh, commercial essay use blood tests to, uh, and use next generation sequencing and they are able to, uh, to identify organism. Then you have the ID by DNA that use the Explify respiratory uh, assay, and they use bronchoalveolar lavage, sputum, and nasopharyngeal swab and tracheal aspirate to detect any kind of uh, infectious agent in those specimen. And then you CSF with offer me, uh, next generation sequencing on CSF sample. And you can also use it for your pet. <laughs> so now that's. Uh, if you have a question now, you can send it here. And then really now, we, we can also look to the, the third generation sequencing and this third generation sequencing is a long read sequencing. And so here I'm just presenting those two uh, different uh, methodology, but the bottom line is that you are able to sequence almost an entire genome at one time. So really what we are dealing with is the first generation sequencing, you have long read, but, uh, but on a long read in comparison, but only a small, you can sequence only a small fr uh, fraction of the genome. The second generation, you can f uh, sequence an entire genome, but all the sequence will be done in small fragments. And that's a problem because then to have the full genome, then you have to pull all those fragments together and to form the whole genome. And then the third generation will be a very long fragment. So that for microbiology, that might be what will be a good, good for us. 
So I want to uh, thank Dr. Uh, Leo Fork for providing all those grants that help us to do all this work. Dr. Ferrari and Dr. Taya Garajan, who are my collaborators on all those projects. Uh, Ellen Barcelo, who is working on our next generation sequencing in uh, Dr. Tagarajan Research Lab. Dr. Beckman, who uh, did some of the sequencing in the, his uh, lab. Uh, Christy, Christine and Todd, who did all the bioinformatic uh, development. And, a, and everyone in the IDDL and molecular pathology lab. Those are some of my reference. Any question? So how do you determine when you have mixed flora? I'm, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not quite sure I understand how you can identify multiple organisms. So when you have mixed flora, and it's where it uh, become very important then to do the alignment. And uh, when you have all those little uh, fragment, then the software is strong enough to get all those fragments and be able to blast them against the reference sequence. And then you're going to see where they match. And because they, are, uh, they will be matching with different organisms, then you know that in your specimen, you have all the organisms they match with. See my comment, Sophie, on how one has a, a gradation in terms of quantity also. Yes, and then it also gives us the quantity of how many of those small fragments match with this particular organism. So if you have uh, only... Uh, 20,000 fragments matching with this organism, and then you have uh, uh, 1 million fragments matching with this organism, then you know you have kind of two organisms in your specimen, and one is more abundant than the other. Yeah, that's a good idea, and people have thought about that, where they are removing the human DNA before even doing the sequencing. The problem is when we are doing that, we are removing some of our pathogen, and because we have so little pathogen, the so little we are removing then affect our final result. But, but like if you're looking for something that's in cerebral spinal fluid, and you, there's a limited number of things that you're looking for, I guess. Um, can you can you somehow get those out first, uh, or drag those out and leave the human behind? N n very, uh, to really sp be specific, because we don't know what really what we are looking for, because it's the unknown. So yeah, some. So some people, what they try to do is to enrich for pathogen. Right. And so sometimes some people use the 16S RNA metagenomic, where they, but then you, you restricting yourself to only bacteria and not virus or any kind of over. Uh, <laughs> but that's what people have thought about that because that's the problem okay. where uh, we are over when we try to remove it, but then at the same time we remove what we are looking for. Okay. That's the problem. That was a nice overview. Thank um, you. It was important that you touched on relative abundance, but one of the challenges in our field for this is DNA homolog. Um, particularly, you know, you did a nice example of Robert Chalbert's, you know, schematic with the human side of it. If you're looking at some calls that are based on 30 to 50 base pair, do, do you feel that we need a threshold of the number of reads that actually map? Now that's different than relative abundance. Yes. But do you think that CLSI or 
or a map should put in a cutoff of the number of rigs that actually map because when you look in the garbage files, you can find actually relative reads that don't map that are thrown out, but that when you run through the database will link to an ID because the databases are only looking for a bug. Yeah. And in my opinion, that's DNA homolog. And I think that that's one of the limitations of Carius's test. I'm convinced that they pick up DNA homolog with really short base pair reads. And because of the way that they do their extraction, they can't actually tell you the number of reads that map. Yeah. Do you yeah. think that that's a quality control going forward? It has to be. I, I mean, it's first when Todd developed, and then when we realized it was making call only on 31 base pair, we were horrified. We were like, what? 31 mm -hmm. base pair? That's, I mean, I would never want to make a call. And it's when Todd uh, changed the software to add like at least 150 yeah. uh, base pair because then we have a better call on that. And it's why at the end, we also wanted to do the full genome assembly yeah. because even the r relative abundance doesn't help because if you go for, from a virus to a bacteria, we said the virus was 170 thousand base pair when we have 4.3 million base pair in a, in a bacteria. So you might have only one bacteria and you might have, uh, a, you know, a thousand of virus. And then the abundance, if you don't put it in the entire genome, you won't know the difference because the read will, you will have much more read for the E. coli, for example, than your CMV virus because the genome is shorter also. So you really need to really do, full, do the full alignment to know what you have in your specimen to be able to know. Betsy had her hand up first. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was just wondering what your volume is like now that you're offering the test. So what are the number and what's kind of the workflow in terms of, it seems like a lot of work in terms of even with all the Okay, so right now we are not offering it for, it's still, you know, we are still working on it. <laughs> we are still working on it. And uh, so the workflow really right now, we, you know, we do the extraction, we do the library and all that. The, uh, the alignment and so software, I mean, Todd, it can be done in a few hours, right? Yes. So in few hours, we can have an identification. And then from there, then just give, a, if we do give a preliminary, and then we do more study to confirm what, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the way we'd be working. I think people should know that Dr. Charlie Chu was supposed to give the grand rounds today, invited by Dr. Arbuckle, he pulled out about a month ago. question. Thank you. <coughs> so I need to take my uh, uh, no, I'm not here. I need to go here, right? To eject wow. it? Yeah. Sophie, your handwriting is so nice. Is that your handwriting? Yeah. <laughs> it's a font. It's comic, comic sans. Oh. I should be writing a